Okay, welcome everybody to uh, make sure this is going here. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome everybody to our first streaming class. I believe I think we are doing some others uh, as more of a, a video conferencing. Um, but this one, uh, it's just going to be me giving the presentation. Uh, feel free to jump into chat if you have any comments or uh, if you have any questions. Um, I'm seeing it uh, live. Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, yeah, so this will be, uh, in, it, we're sort of experimenting with the best way to do some of these classes. This is the first time I've ever done a streaming class. It's just sort of me sitting here talking to my computer, so uh, <laughs> and reading your comments on the on the, the the chat. So tonight's topic is scrying. Uh, let's see here. Let's, I have to look up this way at the the screen. Um, yeah. So scrying is one of the. Uh, uh, more difficult aspects of magic um, precisely because it doesn't have a lot of definition to it um, just as a, a quick overview we're always told you know scry like you, like it's just something that everybody's supposed to know how to do but n very often we don't have a lot of um, uh, teaching around exactly what it is and how to do it well. Uh, so we're going to go into that tonight and hopefully by the end of the class you will have a better idea of what it means to scry and you also have a better idea of how to get better results or perhaps different results uh, out of your magical workings. So uh, let us begin at the beginning. What uh, does it what does the word scry mean? Um, I looked a little bit into this I couldn't find exactly when the first usage of it is but it seems to come from the the uh, the word descry uh, which is uh, the root word for the word describe which we're, we're fairly com uh, used to so descry to spy out or discover by the eye as objects distant or obscure, to espy, to recognize, to discern, to discover, to disclose, or to reveal. So the root of the word is just essentially seeing uh, another uh, way that uh, we can describe this process is just seeing. So people who are, sc are scryers are, can also be known as seers. Uh, they're seeing something they're you know they're seeing it um, yeah and so very often um, we'll get back to that actually uh, so that's where the word descry comes from or just scry um, so what is scrying exactly uh, let's come up with a good definition. My, my preferred definition is scrying is a method of meditation that allows you to communicate with spirits. So uh, other forms of meditation, you know, you're either visualize, you're actively visualizing something or you're actively not visualizing something. Um, this is another category of meditation, in my opinion. Um, in particular, uh, it is one that allows you to communicate. So whereas when we're actively visualizing something, it's expressly just ourselves. Um, when we are actively suppressing our thoughts, that is obviously just ourselves and I suppose the universe. But in scrying, we are specifically using it as a vehicle to communicate with spirits. Com specific communication is the the uh, the thing that kind of separates it. So, um, what then 
uh, and just maybe for those of you who don't have a good grasp of exactly what I'm talking about when I say scry, um, scrying is generally the thing that you do after uh, the invocation or the active parts of the ritual. So um, you you do this elaborate ritual and then uh, you communicate with the thing that you've sort of summoned. And generally this is uh, seen in popular media uh, as, you know, some, usually somebody sitting in front of a crystal ball or uh, somebody like uh, communicating with somebody who is the seer. So the mid there's the operator and then there's the seer and the seer is going back and forth with the, the spirit. Um, so that's uh, how scrying is generally portrayed. Um, so, but we're going to talk tonight about it at, as a form of meditation that allows you to communicate with spirits. So then, um, what are spirits? It's a, is, is really a fair question here. And what are, ast sometimes they're called astral beings, so that doesn't really help us. Then what are astral beings? Um, so Crowley talks about this um, fairly succinctly in uh, book four. Uh, he talks very plainly about it, and um, I'm going to read a few of the passages, and then we'll just discuss them quickly. So, uh, the fundamental problem of religion is this. Are there any praetor human intelligence of the same order as our own? which is not dependent on cerebral structures consisting of matter in the vulgar sense of the word. So, are, do spirits have, he's asking, do spirits have an objective existence in the universe? Um, and th this is sort of one of the things that comes up a lot when you start scrying. Um, sort of a, a struggle that a lot of people have initially when they start scrying uh, is they start to wonder like okay you, you say you have success in scrying they start to wonder do these things like what are these things am I just imagining this or you know you know do these things actually exist so uh, framing the question a little bit there's essentially two major camps of, of thought on this matter and one is, yes, spirits are discarnate entities that we call from you know, somewhere else, some like another plane of existence, or heaven, or hell, or, you know, where they're floating around on some astral plane and we're summoning them to ourselves, or, you know, maybe they're, uh, you know out in outer like literally outer space like you know on a different planet or they're, they're in the stars and they're shooting their rays at us the, these sorts of things or they're in some you know some sort of um, heaven like existence that's like parallel to us you know uh so anyways that, that's like the objective existence as though they were just you know you're just calling somebody on the phone except it happens to be like a, a ritual and you're communicating with them uh, via the ritual. The other argument, or the other school of thought, is that uh, they are portions of our unconscious mind, or portions of our mind, unconscious is kind of a weird word, but portions of our mind or thoughts that uh, we are communicating with, and that's somehow through uh, this form of meditation that we're calling scrying, we're actually just talking to the parts of our brain that normally don't see the light of day like on a good day uh, either we're suppressing them or they're suppressing themselves or they're not um, strong enough uh, impressions for us to be you know to notice them um, so Crowley kind of goes back and forth depending on the book you're reading on some of these and you know for our purposes it I'm gonna say my own personal how I resolve this for myself is just that it doesn't really matter like it's not a useful question to like try to come to the bottom of 
Um, I think it's useful to explore it, but probably it's not terribly useful to um, to explore it to the utmost uh, so long as you are having success. So long as you're having success and you are talking to these things and you're having a worthwhile experience and you're you know learning things and you're getting inspired, it doesn't in my opinion, it doesn't particularly matter whether or not they have um, objective existence or not, or whether you're just talking to, you know, parts of your brain um, so long. Essentially, we're just saying results are the only thing that's important. So, and in my opinion, this sort of insight into our own nature uh, is... It, and perhaps inspiration to do things out in the universe is generally a rare thing, so that's why it ends up being useful um, uh, and not terribly worthwhile to in, in investigate their nature. So uh, Crowley continues on uh, talking about the, the spirits or astral beings in much the same vein. Uh, he says, We may consider all beings as part of ourselves, but it is more convenient to regard them as independent. So uh, he's going a step further and saying, uh, going to the argument of like, how do you know that anybody's real? How do you know, you know, that your neighbor is real or the, that the person you're, you know, sitting across the table from talking to are real? You can easily convince yourself that they're all just parts of uh, yourself, uh, but to act in the world and to have you know it, it, it might it may be true that you know that maybe everything's in your head but to actually act and accomplish anything in this world that may or may not be inside of our head it is more convenient to regard them as external beings uh if you go around acting as though everything's in your head and you can cause things to change by your thoughts it's, it's probably not going to go over so well for you um so, uh, he continues, Magic enables us to receive sensible impressions of worlds other than the physical universe. These worlds have their own laws. Their inhabitants are often quasi-human intelligence. There is a definite set of relations between certain ideas of ours and their expressions and certain types of phenomenon. Thus, symbols, the Kabbalah, etc., enable us to communicate with whom we choose. Astral beings possess knowledge and a power of a different kind from our own. Their universe is presumably of a different kind of ours in, in some respects. It is more convenient to assume the objective existence of an angel who gives us new knowledge than to allege that our invocation has awakened a supernormal power in ourselves. Um... I don't know. I I, I kind of go back and forth with that one too. Like, you know, it is uh, it is convenient to assume there's an angel, but it also is interesting to explore the possibility that we're just merely awakening potentiality in human experience. Anyways, so uh, now that we've safely swept aside the question of the fundamental nature of the spirits. Uh, let's talk about the nature of our perception of their qualities and attributes. So we're, we'll just put that question aside for now um, and talk about well, what, uh, what sort of beings are these uh, spirits or astral beings. And uh, Crowley has a, a really great passage, uh, again in book four, that um, talks about um, about this topic. I'm just going to read it and then I'll, I'll comment a little bit on it. We may admit that any aspect of any object or idea may be presented to us in a symbolic form whose relation to its being is irrational. Thus, there is no rational link between seeing a bell struck and hearing its chime. Our notion of bell, of bell 
is no more than a personification of its impressions on our senses, and our wit and power to make a bell to order imply a series of correspondences between various orders of nature precisely analogous to magic. When we obtain a vision of beauty by use of certain colors, forms, sounds, etc., Astral beings may be thus defined in the same way as material objects. They are, the, they are the unknown causes of various observed effects. They may be of any order of existence. We may give a physical form and a name to a bell, but not to its tone, though in each case we know nothing but our own impressions. We record musical sounds by a special convention. We may therefore group a certain set of qualities and call it Ratziel, or describe an impression as Saturnian without pretending to know what anything is in itself. All we need to know is how to cast a bell that will please our ears, or how to evoke a spirit that will tell us things that are hidden from our intellectual faculties. Every object, soever, may be considered as possessed of an astral shape, sensible to our subtle perceptions. This astral shape is to its material basis as our human character is to our physical appearance. We, Im we may imagine this astral shape. Uh, for example, we may see a jar of opium as a soft, seductive woman with a cruel smile, just as we see in the face of a cunning and dishonest man the features of some animal such as a fox. We may select any particular property of any object and give it an astral shape. Thus, we may take the tricky perils of a mountain and personify them as trolls, or the destructive energies of the Samam, which is a strong uh, dust-laden wind of the desert, and call it a jinn. We may analyze any of these symbols, obtaining a finer form. Thus, the spirit contains an angel, the angel an archangel, etc. We may synthesize any set of symbols, obtaining a more general form. Thus, we may group types of earth spirits as gnomes. All of these may be attributed to the tree of life and dealt with accordingly. The magician may prepare a sensible body for any of these symbols and evoke them by the proper rites. So, um... Again, th these ideas uh, aren't terribly strange to a, a first-year philosophy student. <laughs> the idea that uh, there is a difference between you know, the perception of a thing and the thing in and of itself, and that uh, generally humans are perceiving things in all sorts of different ways because we have to, you know, we're not, we're, we're processing our direct senses through uh, the lens of our, our particular memories and experiences and, uh, but anyways, the, the idea though is that, uh, every, every type, everything that we perceive, we are perceiving, um, not directly, uh, and that perception could be considered an astral shape. Now, Crowley's suggesting that these astral shapes uh, have relations uh, between each other. Um, for example, another, he gave some examples, but another thing to consider is the idea of um, water. So, you picture a lake. And you're, you're any time, like combine all the times you've ever been standing or sitting beside a lake and all the, the, the sensory experiences and uh, what that evokes in your mind when I, when I, you know, when you do this. Um, you might feel the dampness of the water in the air. Uh, you might smell the, the lake. Uh, and it might have some effects on your emotional state too. You might 
be calmed down by this. The, the movement of the water, uh, perhaps blown by wind, calms you down. Or you, you may have other associations completely unrelated to the water of just things you do around a lake, like relax with friends or with a drink. Um, so all those together kind of form this idea of lake of the the spirit of the lake uh and further you can take other forms of water like a river or a stream or an ocean and pick out the things that are common to these uh and sort of refine them and elevate them into a spirit of water um so He's sort of here. He's he's laying out the 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 way one might go, just creating a spirit in general, or perhaps the properties that one would expect to experience uh, when invoking a spirit of water. Um, in particular, he also describes the idea that uh, an experienced magician can prepare a, what he calls a sensible body for these astral forms. And um, it's, in a way, it's sort of like recording them. So now you've got your spirit of water like conceived in your head. But how do we remind ourselves of this spirit in the future? Well, we perhaps we create a sigil. Um, and in the future, when we uh, evoke this sigil, we'll remember these things. Now, the best magicians, then, are those who can produce... Uh, a symbol, uh, say a, a spirit sigil or a spirit name, and have these be meaningful to other people who uh, evoke using those symbols, using that, that sigil in that, in that name. And so a lot of our best grimoires uh, that get passed down are sort of in, in that sort of line, that somebody wrote one of these symbols down, uh, or, or these names, and pass them on to other people. And um, generally, uh, presumably, the ones that are more successful uh, end up, you know, living on. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, the idea behind what a spirit's actual body is composed of <laughs> and how we might go experiencing them uh, when, we, when we go to scry. Um, any questions on that? I'm just looking through the chat here real quick. And everybody can hear me okay? Just making sure my mic setup is, is good here. Um, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's move on. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Lawrence. <laughs> Thanks, Mother of Abominations. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so yeah, so let's move on. What does, uh, how do we scry? What are the things that uh, lead to successful scrying? Um, so in general, this is going to be a description of just any ritual, just because these are applicable to any ritual that you might want to, presumably, any ritual you're going to do, you are also um, trying to communicate with the spirit that you've evoked. Um, occasionally, you do find rituals where there is no, you know, that are evocations or invocations, however you want to look at it, and don't uh, involve spirit communication, but um, we're not going to talk about those right now. <laughs> so, uh, first, let's talk about equipment. So, to have success with scrying, sometimes people imagine that you need, like, an elaborate setup, that you need, like, to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on just the right equipment and, you know, a perfect temple and all, all this. It... it my experience to have success with scrying, the only things you actually need are a clear head first and a, a space for the ritual. Like it doesn't have to be a nice space, but you do need to make room in to physically do it, but also room in your life to do it. 
Um, you don't need any special magical equipment, though um, the simplest pieces of uh, ritual equipment uh, will go a long way. Things like incense and a robe, just very, very simple things that are easy to acquire and to, you know, put on at a moment's notice uh, will help get you to the the mental state that you need to be in um, to, you know, to have a successful scrying experience. The, the spirit probably, you know, in my experience, doesn't really care, like, what you have, what cloth you have on your body, but you're it, for me like just having a robe kind of puts me you know taking off my my clothes you know that i've been wearing in the day that are associated with work or you know other sorts of things and putting on a special garment that is purely for the ritual um goes a long way to um uh to get me into the the headspace so uh And likewise, um, you know, a nice incense will sort of transform the space you're in. And, you know, it it does, uh, you know, you look at the the table of 777 uh, for incenses and you can find a a particular uh, incense that'll, you know, uh, start to help you build associations with that incense and the particular type of spirit that you're working with. So as for a temple space, um, you want uh, a quiet space. Uh, it definitely has to be quiet. Uh, I've tried, I mean, maybe other people are better with this. Maybe people have grown up in loud situations. But for me, um, uh, the temple has, it has to be very quiet. If there's some, if you know, if I can hear my neighbor's TV or, you know, anything like that, it's just gonna ruin it for me um, uh, in particular why this is is when you go into a scrying state like a state where you're actually scrying and being receptive to uh, hearing the the spirit um, it it makes you more sensitive to uh, sound and uh, other things that are happening sort of like uh, if you know, you've, you're starting to fall asleep and you hear a loud noise or something. It, it sounds like it's ten times louder than it actually is. And so uh, any little sounds in your environment are going to um, uh, sort of disturb your mental equilibrium. Uh, another thing that uh, we often don't talk about, but uh, this is just a, a fact of life um, for you know, magicians, is we live with people. And even though the person might not be making a lot of noise, uh, just knowing that they can hear what you're doing uh, can be a distraction to you. So, um, you know, once you've had lots of practice and you, you know, you get familiar with that person, maybe it's, maybe it's different, but, um, uh, so it, it, it can be difficult to try to plan rituals when your partner's out of the house. Uh, one way to get around this is just to incorporate them and ask them if they want to partake of the ritual and just sort of bring them in as a, a scribe or you know some other participant. Or, so, um, yeah, other equipment-related things. Uh, just make sure to have everything you need in the temple before you start. Uh, and make sure they're ready to go, like, so you don't have to, uh, plenty of rituals where we've had to run out of the temple, you know, after we've already banished, and, you know, to get, like, some incense, or, you know, something that, something that we need, or a pen, um, and it, it kind of, it, you know, it's not bad, but it, it just kind of ruins the, uh, ruins the, the seal you've got in the room, um, also, if you are using a scribe, if you've convinced somebody to be part of your madness, uh, make sure you've got uh, paper, pens, and uh, especially a small light g helps out a lot. So you don't want to, um, 
there's been a couple times in, in my past where I've been, you know, we've done the invocation and it's a, the, the air's, you know, vibrating with intensity of talking with the spirit, you know, and I'm like, okay, I was the, we're, we're, you know, going back and forth with the spirit and, you know, the scribe's like, I don't actually have anything to write with. Uh, and so that, that becomes a, a problem. Uh, one thing I do highly recommend is that uh, you get yourself a digital recorder. Uh, so these, I mean, you can do it with your cell phone nowadays. Uh, you know, the battery is, isn't necessarily as good when you're using a cell phone, but um, anything that you can just place in the room that you can just talk and it'll record the um, anything that you say. Uh, even if you're using a scribe, it's good to have a backup because uh, sometimes... I've been talking, like I'll talk very, very fast when I'm scrying uh, and having a, a good success and the scribe will miss it. Um, so uh, yeah, make sure everything's ready. And then uh, pre-ritual, uh, other things to consider. Um, back to the idea of distractions, make sure that your schedule is clear for the next couple hours. Um, a good thing thing to do is to set a period of time that you were going to do your rituals. It's just like exercising. Uh, make sure that you set like aside uh, a period of time to do this. So say, I'm going to do ritual and scrying for an hour, or I'm going to scry for 30 minutes. One, you know, whatever, whenever I start scrying, it's going to be for 30 minutes. Um, because uh, the weight of anticipation uh, that you'll feel while you're scrying could distract you. So if you if you're like, okay, I'm just gonna do this ritual and then I've gotta go off for you know to meet my friends for a movie or you know drinks or something like that, and you've given yourself you know exactly one hour, that's gonna be weighing on your for most people. That's gonna be weighing on your mind, uh, and you definitely don't want that. So just make sure your schedule's clear. Um, and that you are set for a very certain period of time. Uh, uh, modernly, make sure your phone is off or uh, silenced. Uh, if you're, you know, doing something in your temple and your phone starts ringing in the other room, you may have the willpower to not answer it. But at the same time, you're going to be thinking, "Who called me? I got to go, you know, deal with that." Or who texted me? Um, make sure your pets. Are in places where they won't distract you. Uh, some people have good familiar pets uh, that like to be in the room. Uh, in which case, make sure your cat or dog is in the room. Then they can you know, watch you and that sort of thing. Because uh, nothing is worse than like you know starting your ritual and then it's like you suddenly you start scrying or whatever, and suddenly you hear scratching on your door <laughs> or so, you know animal noises, and you're like, oh wait a minute, that's right, I own a pet, and uh, let them in. That's kind of a distracting thing. Or uh, I had a cat once that did not like ritual at all, did not like incense, didn't like uh, the noises that his his owner or the, the the human he lived with was making, uh, and would just demand to be out of the room. So. Uh, had to make sure he was out of the room uh, before I started. Other things to do uh, pre-ritual. Uh, fasting can improve the results of scrying. Um, it, it's, it, it varies depending on the person to person and metabolism to metabolism. Uh, you definitely don't want to go either way to the point of distraction so if you are like so hungry that you know you can't you, you're not going to be able to concentrate um that's going to be a problem uh some people do during fasting can you know or I, pretty much everybody who does fasting experiences that but then they get over it so there's like a period of time where your body's going to be uh, mad at you and if you can just get over that maybe you're in a good position but you know if you've got a scry right now um, and you're feeling hungry just have a little snack it's um, unless you've taken some oath that you know you won't ever eat before ritual or you know something like that it's, it, it's just going to be better off for you to not be distracted um, in my experience heavy meals beforehand uh, are a problem because they put me to sleep 
that's just me. Crowley talks about doing Enochian rituals where you essentially uh, fast for... It's a, it's a three-day-long ritual, and you fast for, like, the first two days, and you can only eat, like, duck eggs. I don't know why duck eggs specifically, but duck eggs and water. And then you uh, have a feast, like... Um, and then essentially scry for eight hours after the feast. So um, that for you know, if you have a big feast, that first you know half hour to an hour is going to be pretty bad. But I guess if you set aside eight hours, maybe you'll be all right. Uh, so yeah, the um, other things to consider are various intoxicants. Um, with alcohol, I've had okay uh, experience in the past. It's it's kind of a, a that one's a little bit hard to deal with you um it can improve immediate results like the immediate but it will sort of reduce your stamina for scrying in the like a long run like you whenever i drink beforehand i'm usually like good for about 20 minutes of scrying and then i'm like okay i'm done and, you know um uh marijuana which you should definitely not take at any oto uh official event uh but you know it, it's legal in the state that i'm in um it can help uh but it's difficult it, it it makes it difficult to discern um useful ideas from not useful ideas so if you're gonna do it make sure you're practiced at scrying beforehand one thing to try uh, if you do really want to try it is scry for like set a, a time to scry like 10 to 15 minutes and and then maybe partake of an intoxicant after that period of time just to see the difference um, is uh, another good practice then you can definitely compare you know directly uh, the results so uh, now we get into the ritual itself. Uh, what sorts of rituals are we talking about here? I'm not going to go... Um, oh, psychedelics. Uh, I personally do not have a lot of experience with psychedelics. Um, uh, I know some people have had very good experience with, with them. Um, in my experience... Experience uh, mushrooms did not lead to a good scrying experience, uh, and as for the others, um, I'm gonna have to defer to somebody a little bit more experienced. So uh, the ritual, um, the, what types of rituals we're we're, we're talking about? Uh, so I'd say at at bare minimum, the ritual consists should consist of a banishing followed by an invocation and then to scrying. Uh, you can make it more or less elaborate as you wish, depending on you know what sorts of um, things you're involved in uh, or what sort of requirements the tradition that you're working with uh, has. But uh, the general form is banish, uh, then invoke, then scry. So the banishing is, uh, the idea is to clear the mind so ultimately the mind your mind is the place that we're going as we've discussed before the mind is the place that you are going to be experiencing uh, the communication with the spirit so you don't want it filled up with lots of things um, uh, you know we, we've set aside a whole room and uh, in you know both physically and mentally and the idea behind the banishing is now to just finalize that and finalize it in a, in a formal way that's incorporated into the ritual. Um, the banishing itself can be as simple or elaborate as you your art instructs. Um, but the important thing is to make sure that it is something that is regular. Um, the idea behind that being that uh, a regular experience, something you've experienced before that you are now seeing again, uh, 
will not be something that you know just dis- disturbs your mind uh, whereas like if you were just like okay i'm just going to pick up a new banishing ritual and run with it for the purposes of this ritual y- you know when you're scrying you might be thinking more about your banishing ritual than you are the contents of the invocation um so the purpose of the banishing clear out your mind the purposes of the invocation bring things back into the mind that you want to experience um so just as the banishing is driving out you know calming down your perception and driving out anything from your perception you don't want by invoking we're bringing the things in that we are going to see that we are going to then scry um so uh again this can be as elaborate as you want um experiment with what works for you uh certain things that um that we'll probably discuss in other classes different uh techniques and uh, different types of rituals but whatever if you are using a particular uh, like an invocation like a lengthy invocation that is like a recitation of something um definitely consider reading it more than once uh and tr- you know because you might see like the goetia or an Okian or whatever and you're just like i'm just going to read this once and uh you know then you look around and waiting for something to happen no get, get like read it two or three times um and try to get yourself in inf- more and more inflamed uh with each recitation uh and, and inflame we don't necessarily mean that you're shouting but like get more and more into the spirit of the uh of the invocation as you do it um so some things that help out uh with the invocation first definitely just as we said don't try a new banishing ritual don't uh don't try to do a cold read of an invocation i mean you you can but in my experience a cold read of a ritual is just um a recipe for not a great time <laughs> um First off, you're going to, st- you know, if it has any words that are uh, either in an angelic language or some other language that you're not familiar with, uh, you're going to stumble over the pronunciation of those words. And when that happens in your mind, like you, you might think, oh, it's going to be all fine. But in your mind, it's it's it adds stress. Like every little thing that's a stressor to you uh, is going to tear you a little bit further away from having a clean scrying experience it's gonna you know that that stress now is kind of just building up in your mind uh as opposed to the spirit um so make sure you've gone over what you're gonna say during the invocation beforehand and that you can say it fluidly um and without difficulty Another thing is if you are using one of those uh, invocations that has words that you're unfamiliar with, make sure you've gone through and you know what each one of those words means. Uh, This lets you say them with intention. Um, If you don't say them with intention, you're just going to be, it's going to feel like you don't own the invocation. And it's going to be hard to... um, get into the spirit uh, of the invocation uh different ways to do this are to either memorize them beforehand another good way uh, another trick that helps is to write the english on the script above or below the word and that way you can sort of carry the intention in your mind as you say it this especially with enochian um this isn't or perhaps latin this is important uh just because nobody's very few people have memorized enochian um (laughs) so uh uh, having the translation right there it helps out a lot uh another different like a different technique that's often used in rituals is chanting um this is one of my favorites. Uh, you can see it in the, the 231 ritual that we just put on the channel, uh, on this particular channel, 
uh, for the fire, uh, the spring equinox, a uh, ritual for invocating, uh, invocation of a, a fire spirit, uh, where we put the sigil in front of us and we chant the name over and over and over again. Uh, regardless of the tradition you're in, if you've got a spirit with a sigil and a name, this uh, will definitely help out a, a lot. Um, uh, you can look in Crowley's um, Magic... Uh, or book four, part one, uh, for different mantra techniques. So uh, that leads us now. We've we've prepared. We did our banishing. We did our invocation. Now it's time to scry. Uh, so how do we scry? In my experience, the easiest way to scry is to close your eyes just stop what you're doing close your eyes and sort of just relax as deeply as possible like almost like you're trying to fall asleep on the spot um and it sounds simple but it's difficult to do if you are excited or nervous or you know anything like that you're basically you're just getting into a deeply receptive state and any stresses that you've had will sort of uh, or that you're allowing to any stresses that you're allowing to stay with you are gonna work against that so the idea is that you are um, relaxing very deeply and your conscious mind is becoming slow and moving out of the way and you're going into like a dreamlike state so oftentimes i compare i compare directly the place where you scry where you're seeing the spirit or where you're communicating to the spirit is very much the same as what you experience when you're dreaming uh, it's sort of like um, lucid dreaming, but in reverse. So we're starting from a waking state and moving to uh, a sleeping state. And the idea is that um, we, that the, the spirit, because so the spirit can't, like, most spirits, in my experience, don't have physical bodies. They don't have physical manifestations. They're not. You're not going to do the invocation. The spirit's going to like walk through the door, or like appear magically in the room, like in the corner, and walk up to you and start talking. Um, I most magicians that I've talked to uh, have had the same experience. There's a, they, the spirits just don't appear physically and talk to you the way you would hear with your ears. So uh, they don't, you know, they they don't have vocal cords that vibrate the air and you know vibrate the membranes of your ears. Instead, uh, we talk to them through the the, the non-conscious mind. So the, the other people will call it uh, the ast. Levy in particular calls it the, the astral light. Uh, sometimes it's called the astral plane. Uh, the idea is that our yeah our, our subconscious mind unconscious mind is somehow able to perceive this so different than lucid dreaming in that we are very much in control of what we're doing um we're never you know we're never in a state where uh, we're just perceiving random things specifically we've done all this work all the banishing and invocation to put things into this the astral light that we want to experience. Um, if you're having trouble getting into that state, uh, if you're, you know, one thing people worry about is, oh, what if I fall asleep? It's like, no, just if you're gonna, you know, if if you fall asleep, then that's, you know, just something that you've learned at that point. Just try to relax as deeply as possible. Um, you know, if you happen to fall asleep, at least you get, you know, a nap out of the experience, and that's not so bad. As you get older, <laughs> naps are a luxury. Uh, so another, uh, like a good metaphor that I I like to use for the, uh, for this is the idea that um, the astral plane is the night sky. 
um, this you're seeing stars there and the stars are always there even during the day we just don't see it because the the sun our conscious mind is in the way um, so all we're doing is we're trying to get that sun out of the way so we can take a look at the the, the night sky so uh, that's my number one technique to um, to do this. There's other techniques. Uh, I don't really recommend uh, them for beginners. Uh, usually things like uh, visual mediums like crystal balls or gems or obs black or obsidian mirrors. Uh, some people use uh, or popularly it's just you know you hear described flames or oil upon water or these other you know sort of, sort of methods. Um, I don't I don't know many magicians who have had great experience or uh, great success with uh, visual techniques where you have your eyes open while you're doing it um, specifically because you know your eyes are a uh, very strong sensory organ so the, you know they're gonna distract you from uh, actual scrying um, but uh, sir, I think it's, it, it seems to be associated with certain types of uh, maybe learning, uh, you know, the, the, the ways people learn. Um, uh, there's, um, Levy actually talks a little bit about it in Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic. Um, he's uh, in the, the chapter on divination. He says, uh, vision in water operates through glare and fatigue of the optic nerve. So he's talking about like oil and water, having like a pool of water where you're looking at the water. Uh, so vision in, in water operates through glare and the fatigue of the optic nerve, which yields its functions to the translucent and produces an illusion of the brain, which then takes the reflections of the astral light for real images. Also, nervous people, having weak eyesight and vivid imaginations, are most suited to this type of divination, which has the most success when it is performed by children. Uh, so yeah, despite being a, a nervous and weak eyesighted person with a vivid imagination, I've personally never had much experience, much uh, success with, with these techniques. Um, but again, the, the, you know, regardless of if you're using a physical medium or... Um, uh, or just simply closing your eyes the sort of the technique is the same you're deeply relaxing and you're bringing up images uh, or becoming aware of things uh, deep in your uh, unconscious mind uh, so then what does success look like those are that's the method to achieve success what does success look like and this is another part where um, people often have a lot of trouble uh, specifically because they you know you, you do all this you've done all this work and you know you m may have prepared for hours and hours and hours and you know the invocation took you you know 20 minutes or half an hour and you're sitting there alone in a room and you're wondering when's it gonna start when's the six you know when am I gonna actually have success with this um, and that is another big challenge for beginners, uh, how to get over that sensation. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, people have certain expectations on what success looks like. And if it, you know, if their results that, that are, if the things that are happening don't match their expectations exactly, they dismiss it. So the number one thing I can recommend is just keep a very open mind to what success looks like when you're doing this. Uh, uh, oftentimes doubt or even the fear of doubt uh, can stop you from having a, a successful scrying experience. Um, in particular, you're gonna know that you've succeeded uh, when one of several things happen to you. You could start seeing things uh, you could start hearing things. Um, sometimes it's not as strong, though. Sometimes you are just getting impressions of meaning. Like, you're, you're getting these more... I mean, this is the, the subtle astral fluid that we're working with here. So sometimes these are just sort of... Um, uh, 
uh, just small perceptions that you're having. Um, it, it, my my advice is to just sort of take it all in. Just be receptive to these. Write down these perceptions or say them out loud if you've got a recording device or you know that sort of thing. Um, if even if they seem small. Uh, sometimes the, once you start paying attention to those small things, they start to snowball and they start to grow larger and larger or they sort of start building upon themselves. And so it, it's hard to say what really is going to lead to a, a strong success in scrying. Um, but in particular, just be open-minded. Uh, at, at the most informal scrying success that I've ever had, it just feels more like a good brainstorming session where I'm just coming up with ideas for new art projects or, or new writing or I'm having insight into something I'm already writing, that sort of thing. Um, and that's not going to, you know, that's not necessarily a bad use of time. Um, so other times I've had very strong experiences with scrying. I've had the whole experience of actually seeing and thinking I'm hearing um, a spirit. Uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, I, I didn't necessarily confuse it for reality, uh, but again, it's when you're in that sort of liminal state uh, where you're experiencing the sort of the, the type of uh, situation where you're experiencing perceptions as though in a dream, it can feel, you know, dreams feel real to people. Uh, and the, it can feel very real if you can get into that state. Um, so, yeah, the, just that being said, uh, when you do have success, don't necessarily take it as a true thing so this is another warning to, to consider um is that just because the spirit told you to do a certain thing or to act in a certain way or to do you know whatever don't don't do it you know don't do it unless you really want to like take it as though you were talking to an external entity that you need to evaluate whether or not the things it's saying are or or the impressions it's giving you or the things it's showing you uh, whether or not um you have to evaluate whether or not they are useful to you uh so you might a lot of times uh, people receive words when they start you know they'll start saying letters like a a b j m z you know something like that and then you sit there and you wonder well what what does this word mean and the spirit's not telling you the spirit's like i don't know man i i just gave you that with those letters uh maybe just you know note that those letters happened and move on don't you know don't go right out and get a tattoo of them and hope that you know later maybe some meaning will be ascribed to them um just Take them as they are and, you know, uh, evaluate them for what they're worth. Another thing that is uh, very permissible and very encouraged is to ask the spirit. Like, if you see something or you have an impression of something, ask it, hey, what does this mean? Like, I, I don't know exactly what this means and I'm hoping you can tell me, you know, uh, however you want to do it. Um, but... Uh, that will often prompt more information about that sigil or impression or word or that sort of thing and um, sort of further the vision. So don't be afraid to uh, ask. Um, so yeah, and my uh, final piece of advice on it is uh, try to have fun. I mean, like the, the whole point of this is to get something worthwhile. Uh, and if you are having a bad time, like if you continuously do this and you have a bad time and you're just, the scrying isn't good, change something up or, you know, try something else. Um, the most important part is that we're using this to improve ourselves. Uh, and if you're not getting that out of it, you know, just, um, maybe change something up and be patient. Uh, success can often take a, a while. Um, you might not see anything during the first five or ten or even twenty minutes when you're scrying, and 
in that last five minutes or last ten minutes or however that you've decided you're going to sit there and scry, something amazing will come to you. And, you know, you might have a project then you have to work on for the next three months or you might get some insight into some problem that you've been facing either, you know, external to yourself or internal to your own psyche and you just have a big breakthrough or, you know, something like that. So, like, uh, you know, just hang in there while you're doing it and um because uh, definitely if you're sitting there just thinking about what a fool you are uh yelling at your wall <laughs> it's not going to happen uh that that uh, that will definitely make it not happen so uh that's what we have for the uh how to scry uh now i've got um some notes on uh, what let's see here Hold on one second. now I've got some notes on things uh, that will help you scry that will help you have a better scrying experience while you're doing uh, this work so and for the most part I'm, I'm drawing these uh, some people are familiar with Crowley's work uh, Lieber E Vel Excite Excitatorium Excitatorium uh, these, uh, there's seven practices in this and they, for the most part, they all relate to having a good scrying experience. Um, so the first one is keep a magical diary. Uh, we've talked already about the different ways you can record your scrying experiences. Uh, the most important thing though is that you do record them. Uh, if you're not recording them while you are having them, uh, chances are you will forget them, either in five minutes or in several days. And then it might not, you know, it just is sort of like you didn't do it at all. Uh, but in particular, it's important to try to, to write them down as quickly as possible. Um, I've had plenty of scrying experiences where uh, I'm in such a relaxed state that I listen to the recording or read what the scribe wrote afterwards and I don't remember any of it. Like, I'm like, who? wow, okay, that was cool. I mean, this is a cool you know, thing that you, you wrote down, but I, I don't recall it. So uh, definitely uh, record them and then go over them after the scrying is done just so you can add uh, notes um, to you know you might have you know, if a scribe did it or you, you know whatever you might remember things that you happened during the scrying session that you want to add in or uh, oftentimes drawing a picture helps like it's very hard to describe in words often what a sigil looks like so you'll have to you know write the uh, draw those as they come up um and uh it's great to you know it helps you go back and compare um the oftentimes I'll do before I scry a particular spirit, I'll go back and look at what happened previously and that helps, it just all builds, that helps me uh, have success this time around as well. Or there's some technique in there that I remember uh, or that I wrote down that helped me get to the place where um, I was having a good vision. Second, uh, physical clairvoyance. Uh, this is one where Crowley is describing practices that he believes will lead you to having physical clairvoyance, in particular uh, guessing or trying to scry the top card of a tarot deck. So you just go through the, the deck and you try to guess either the card or the suit uh, of the card or whether it's a trump. Uh, and you know, according to his recommendation, you can actually get better at it. Um, I don't know if that's true. I've not really heard anybody who's described that properly. But what it does do is sort of put you in the same... It, it's good practice for um, going into that meditative state um, and trying to look into that, that part of your mind uh, without, you know, something that you can do at a moment's notice without, like, a whole lot of preparation. Third is asana, or posture. Um, I say that while I'm sort of slumped over my office chair here. Uh, <laughs> so it is vital that 
you suppress the you know anything that's going on like the sensations from your body while while you're doing this um and Lieber, this section of Lieber E says, you must learn to sit perfectly still with every muscle tense for long periods. Uh, but the the point of it is to be sort of indifferent to the way that you're sitting um, and be indifferent to the, the signals that your body is giving you. Uh, other ways to get around this are just to be in a comfortable position when you are scrying. Uh, there's nothing particularly mystical in my experience about sitting in a particular position like the arrow or the ibis or uh, they can lead to certain experiences that are nice but um, like I said more importantly it's 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 important that you're comfortable if your legs go to sleep and start causing you pain and you're worried about you know whether or not you're cutting off the supply of blood to your legs during the scrying session you're not going to have a good scrying session you're just going to be thinking about your legs and uh or you know thinking about what future health problems you're causing by sitting in uh sitting on your legs in in the future so just get comfortable um one of my favorite ones to use i mean a chair is perfectly fine just sit in the god pose and don't make a big deal about it uh, another one that i particularly enjoy is i have a large um foam bean bag that i sit in that's very comfortable and just sort of fits to where however i put my legs fourth pranayama the practice of pranayama um in my experience doing pranayama before a ritual is very beneficial um it can help clear the mind um, and uh, so yeah if, if you're having trouble practicing or if you're having trouble scrying or doing an invocation do some pranayama beforehand or uh, incorporate chanting into your ritual um, the chanting will work like pranayama to a certain extent um, uh, so you sort of get a, a, a two-in-one there Dharana, control of thought. Uh, these are practices um, similar to the the physical, to the clairvoyance, uh, where you are imagining. You know, it's, a, it's that meditation form that I talked about, where you you are actively imagining a symbol in your mind, uh, and this can all this definitely will help your scrying muscles out as you're doing it. Um, it sort of gets you in the mode of actually seeing things in your mind. Now there are uh, there's current research going on uh, with the idea of some people aren't able to see things in their head, or in or vice versa, they're not able to hear themselves think. Uh, and these are just different ways of being human. Um, so this can help strengthen some of some of those uh deficiencies um yeah aside from that it also helps you um uh, push your personal thoughts away so any, any sort of practices like that that um uh, will help <clears throat> uh next is physical limitations this one uh Crowley talks about things like staying awake for you know see how long you can stay awake for see how long you can run this sort of thing uh these don't necessarily have much to do with scrying um other than Crowley describes a lot of scrying uh techniques that are sort of endurance uh challenges in a way like a lot of uh uh, like one of the ways in the a book he calls Liber 8, which is out of Liber 418, he describes an experience where you get to uh, invoke the Holy Guardian Angel and you need lots of days worth of time to do it. So this is more just general good magic um, uh, magic practice. It doesn't necessarily relate specifically to scrying. But uh, the last one, uh, the course of reading that he recommends is... Uh, is super important um 
First off, it turns your attention to the goal of these workings. Like, they're, they're just a lot of religious books, a lot of the Thelemic corpus is in there, um, his, a couple history books, a lot of mythology books. Uh, so it, it turns your attention to just the idea of religion and spirituality in general. But more importantly to scrying, uh, it gives the angels uh, something, or the, the spirits something to work with. Um, uh, so because the spirits are talking to you through your mind your mind essentially contains the entire set of symbols or the entire alphabet that they have to work with. And so if you just have a bunch of junk in your head, um, you're not, you know, you're not giving much for the angels to work with. It's best if they, you know, if you start scrying and they're like, well, let me show you the meaning of some parable that, you know, has mystified thinkers forever, you know, and Crowley has plenty of this. He, the, in the vision of the voice, there's lots of, um, you know, Bible stories that the angels use and reinterpret in new ways that are applicable to Thelema, uh, and lots of, uh, you know, characters from other, uh, religions other than Christianity pop up and are sort of related to each other or explained in a particular way. And if you, if you just don't have that set of symbols in your head, you're, you know, you're missing out on that portion uh, of the working, uh, and you're probably going to have some, you know, some other symbol set in there. So, you know, like you, you really don't want the Kardashians explaining to you the secrets of the of the universe, or, or, uh, or you know, cartoon characters or that sort of thing, because uh, you know, that's what they have to work with. Um, you know, generally people don't receive things. Another thing to consider is generally people don't receive uh anything in languages that are unfamiliar to them so most of Crowley's works are received in the form of English that he was familiar with using vocabulary that he was already aware of he didn't receive uh any of the class a works uh with words that he you know were completely unfamiliar to him um with perhaps the a couple exceptions but you know for the most part it's um it's something that's familiar to him. Uh, so yeah, just give them something to work with. Uh, one example I have is we were uh, a scribe, myself and a scribe were doing some uh, Enochian workings, and um, uh, I. So we were taking turns scrying, and when it came to his turn, he he started you know he did the invocation and he's like okay i see oh gosh i don't think i should say it i don't, I don't it doesn't sound like something that uh you know is a worthwhile result and i'm like no just go with it man just do whatever whatever you're saying just say it and get it out um because if you if you if you see things and you don't say them sometimes they become uh, obsessive and you can't move on like the spirit won't let you move on so you just got to say it get it out and move on so uh, he didn't want to say and I, I finally convinced him and he's like well i it's like you know the cartoon scooby doo i see uh, a character running away real frantically uh, in a wacky fashion from um a, m a mummy that's chasing him down the down the the hallway and i'm like okay cool so we move on uh we're comparing notes afterwards and for that particular aether uh you know i saw something that was more like a traditional like a sarcophagus opened and there was like a mummy in there and it had this whole meaning um we compared to Crowley's vision and he saw a bull that was chasing him and he had to drive away this bull and he interpreted it as, or the angel interpreted it as, uh, the bull is Osiris, uh, who, whose form is a mummy, the personification of the old Aeon who we need to defeat before we can move on into the new Aeon. And so it was just, it was just funny that we were, 
you know, these are all the symbols that we all had to work with, but it was sort of the same message across this. It was just, here's how it's being interpreted for each, each of us uh, individually. So yeah, that's, um, that is the end of my list. Uh, I hope you all, uh, go out there and have, you know, uh, have a new, uh, try scrying with a renewed appreciation if you haven't had uh, much success in the past. Uh, definitely uh, feel free to ask any questions now or in the future. Um, I'll do my best to help out uh, anybody who's seriously uh, doing doing the work. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn to the chat. Does anybody in the chat uh, have any questions? that uh, while we're still streaming here. So um, JM Lucino asks, are there particular spirits you suggest beginners start with? Are some easier to summon or get results with than others? So uh, Yes and no. I think it it, it in it depends on the person in particular. Uh, my recommendation is that you go with the system that most draws you, you know your fascination. So, like, don't just pick some random. Uh, system or you know a particular invocation or spirit or whatever just because you think you should work with it um if it doesn't if it doesn't inspire you you're probably not going to have a, a a lot of success with it uh in particular i don't really care for um like certain judeo Christian uh, systems. Uh, one one that that really kind of threw me through a loop is we did a lot of work um, when I was just first starting as a magician. Uh, myself and another person did a lot of work putting together a, a, a whole temple to do the Goetia. So we made the, the circle. We made. Uh, lots of things to wear you know made some nice altars that sort of thing got the sigils all prepared um and then when we were doing it i really discovered like part of the invocations have you call upon the name of jesus like and say by the name of jesus you know you're compelling them and you're threatening them with hell and this sort of thing and like the whole time i was sitting there thinking look i'm not Christian this is like it's not, I don't really feel this like I, I'm trying to get into it. I'm trying to imagine Jesus is like a you know some sort of God form or something that you know will work for me but it, ju it just didn't happen and I just sort of end up feeling a little silly about the whole thing uh, and consequently you know the working didn't really give me that good results um, some you know I got some results but you know in the ultimately they weren't worthwhile like you might you know you might see something or something like that but it's not going to be that uh, it's not going to produce something that makes you want to come back to the work again and again and um, so uh, work with a system that catches your imagination uh, work with the more um, the more elemental the spirits are, the more you are going to be able to uh, work with them. Something that, that's worked out w very well for me is sticking to spirits that are associated with uh, paths uh, on the tree of life. So these are going to be your elemental spirits, like your, you know, just fire, not, you know, earth of fire, whatever, but just the pure elemental spirits of uh the plant the seven planets and the 12 uh, zodiac um if the spirit you're working with is strongly associated with one of just one of those you're going to have a really easy time with it uh especially working in the hermetic tradition as Th Thalema does so 
um, and these kind of fall under what we call path workings. Um, so, you know, if you choose, like, go check out our fire ritual and, you know, we're, we're choosing colors and incenses and all sorts of things uh, that are associated with fire and using them in our ritual. Um, and this will help you have a better uh, appreciation of those particular sort of more elements of, of spirits um, there's a large uh, library to you know of um, invocations and poetry to these particular spirits and so you can sort of construct rituals that uh, um, uh, you know that 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 get you to where you want to be uh, in terms of the uh, scrying so uh, I've had experience with Guisha. I've also had experience with Enochian. Um, and I had a lot of success with Enochian. Um, but uh, it's it, that system in particular has a lot of really complex elements to it that I, most uh, people that are even experienced with it aren't going to pretend to understand. Uh, so that can be an impediment to uh, people starting off with it uh, but also to continuing to work with it if you get five years into Enochian and you're still like what does any of this mean uh, that can become a block um, additionally some of the spirits uh, the governors uh, in Enochian uh, are mixtures of uh, the elements that we talked about so a lot of the uh, a lot of the, like the governors, for example, are going to be um, a combination of a planet and a zodiacal symbol. Uh, if you read the you know the, the 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 system very closely, and so it doesn't really help if you haven't you know if you haven't had experience with Mercury, to then go in and try to scry a spirit that's like you know Mercury and. Um, you know Jupiter combined or you know something like that it's you know you're going to be wishing that you had done that preliminary um, elemental work uh, but yeah and then, you know and there's different systems the Golden Dawn has a its own particular system um, of working with spirits there's other um, uh, traditions like uh, voodoo and those sorts of things that have their own particular ways of invoking the spirits it really whatever it calls to you um, is what I'd recommend Uh, so yeah, so I don't see any other questions. Um, like I said, feel free to reach out with any questions uh, after this. Um, or if you are uh, listening to this in the future, uh, feel free to leave any comments and we'll be watching this and, and uh, answering those. Uh, we do have one more question. Uh, Mary says... I've often just sat as an empty vessel to see what wants to communicate with me using the obvious protections, etc. What are your thoughts on that? So uh, this sort of falls under the category uh, of the clairvoyance that we, we talked about in uh, Libra E. Um, it's... Uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to depend on each person, right? So this is, it's just a different form of meditation in a way, uh, depending on if you've banished beforehand or not. Like if you just want to sit down and like experience, you know, just what's going on in inside your head, uh, just sit down and do that. I think that's a perfectly um, fine thing to do. Uh, and a lot of people don't do it enough. <laughs> um, uh in terms of like having spirits talk to you that way uh i've not had a lot of uh you know success that way um with just you know some specific spirit coming to me like you, you're still gonna get the impressions and you know all, all the things that we talked about that sort of come with success and scrying they're just gonna be undirected is how i see it um uh some schools do use this technique a lot like i was uh, i once attended a um uh, a talk by david lynch uh we went down to see him at the 
the TM Center in Iowa. This is when I was living in Minnesota. We went to see him uh, uh, give him to- a talk down in the Transcendental Meditation uh, in Iowa, and um, he that was his technique for coming up. That was how he did Transcendental Meditation. He just he said I would just sit there and whatever you know I would go down deep into the depths of my mind and try to hook a good idea. He com- he, was, he sort of compared it to fishing. And um, uh, he said he ended up putting a lot of those sorts of ideas into his movies. And you can see that. Like, the movies are very much like a sort of a hodgepodge of random uh, things out of a particular person's uh, subconscious. Um, Some people uh, will, you know, some people might get directed to work with a particular spirit in this manner. And usually then they would have to go on the traditional route, I suppose. Um, A lot of uh, American, uh, a lot of the, uh, what do they call it, the spiritualism of of the early 1900s used this sort of method. Um, And oftentimes, you know, they would end up saying they were talking to a dead person or... uh, you know, some other discarnate, like, person, like, being, um, and, you know, if that works for you, I'd say go with that, but, um, it's fairly undirected, and it's probably hard to, uh, reproduce or to, um, uh, have a lot of consistent success doing that, uh, specifically because you aren't feeling you know with the with our tradition you're or with this technique the invocation technique you are specifically exciting your mind or you're ex- or you know making a, a, a large amount of uh, uh, movement towards a particular idea and that momentum is what is drawing you through a good scrying experience um and so uh with a more of an empty vessel technique, you would, uh, presumably you wouldn't have that momentum. So, um, and it might work for, you know, one technique might work better for uh, one person and one for another. So it's just the, the, again, whatever draws you, uh, and experiment and really have fun. Like this is, uh, this is in my opinion, the, this sort of, um, activity is the point of magic like you know we you why somebody might ask well why do you do all these invocations and create all you know all these robes and you know do all rent these elaborate temples and in my answer to that is that when we do scry we have these useful results and that uh, that's what the real driver for magic is in my opinion Uh, do we have any other questions? Cool. Well, uh, thanks everybody. This was uh, 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 a great experiment with our, our new streaming and our everybody staying home. Uh, let us know uh, how you liked this. Um, in the future, we might go with this sort of um, sort of. Uh, program again or another possibility is some of the more uh, uh, video conferencing uh, types of uh, classes so thanks again and uh, I will see you uh, in the next class thanks a lot everybody 93